answer segment now. So uh, how this will work, you just raise your hand, we'll bring the mic to you, and then you ask your question. Okay. Pastor, you gave a very interesting metaphor about our relationship with our government. That we are in a very abusive relationship. <laughs> And this is why we are going to have a divorce. I have noticed that in the majority of the videos which I have been following thus far, you say that we are doing this so that government can listen to us, government can listen to us, government can listen to us. Government has been listening, but they have not been giving us the response that we want. We are tired of talking. We want results, we want change. So I would personally like to know where is your stance? Are you still standing by government and saying that you want them to change? Or you want us now to change government? <laughs> um, I've just got one question that comes in two parts. Um, the first part is, and you've answered this many times in your videos, and you addressed it right now, but from the beginning of this flag movement, um, whether you like it or not, you've taken up the Moses role. Yes. Um, unintentionally, uh, as a student of quasi social movements, labor movements, and leftism, this generally does happen, where eventually there is a whole movement behind the Moses figure, uh, which you've done excellently so far. Um, I want to know, how you're going to remove yourself from that role, uh, apart from telling us as citizens it's time to move forward. Um, and then secondly, and I think for me more importantly, um, the Zimbabwean government by nature is a very repressive government. Um, it relies heavily on cohesive forces, military tactics, disappearance acts, killings, the list is long. Um, how long do you think this movement, like you said, we're still in our baby stages, we're still learning how to walk. What, what's the limit for collateral damage before we, we, we look into what some critics call adventurism? How, how, how long do we carry this burden of playing by the rules against the big government that does not care for them? Thank you. I've been ready for this, eh? I, I've been very ready. Alright, uh, first you say change is coming from places we didn't expect. So, uh, first you say change is you say the change is coming from places we didn't expect. In other words, uh, we are not looking at the usual political players for the movement to go on. We are used to MDC, MDC Renewal, MDC 99, MDC whatever. <laughs> And now we've got someone different proposing the government. And we know the Zanfia government is reactionary. So it is kind of expected that the government is right out right now, but we all know the same government. After a while, it really doesn't care. It has done that over and over again. Uh, the MDC since 2000 has been waiting for uh, electoral reforms. In 2018, they had a whole Maputo summit, and the president, what did he do? using his presidential powers act or something like that, announced that elections are July 31, I think. Uh, so no reforms with that. That's what they do. That's what they do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing you say, there will be no year number 37. Right? Right. Uh, what I speak from that is there has been 36 years of proof of one party, right? One person is the head. I only look at the CEO. So from this, I just say there's been 36 years of rule of President Robert Kabila Mugabe, right? And we are refusing for a year number 37. All fair and fine, right? But how are we going to do that? Are we going to be social media activists to our and protest all the way like, okay, no more board not. Right now, yesterday, they did a bond law protest. They said no more bond law. And Mabuja, the governor, and Shilamasa always come out and tell us these things. Um, I think we, obviously, the, for all these questions and contributions uh, are questions that uh, I think everyone who is 
uh, in Zimbabwe, even people that are not Zimbabwean are also asking, you know. Uh, and so it's a great time for us to contribute towards uh, some, of the, some of the answers that are needed here. I want us to not lose sight of the fact that as it stands, we have a victory on our hands. And our government knows that. We have gained ground. And sometimes the tendency when people are on a journey to get something that they have always wanted or something that they have longed for so desperately, sometimes the tendency is to become impatient. Sometimes the tendency is to become rash in getting what we want. Sometimes the tendency is to eventually say, let's do it by all means necessary. Or let's just do whatever we need to do. Let's just go for it because it is so close. And I want to obviously <coughs> caution a little bit on that by saying just because it's close doesn't mean we should jump for it. And when we, we've come in the last two months with actions that are non-violent, with actions that are just speaking truth to power, operating within our constitution and within the law, learning how to use our constitution to our advantage, the same constitution that has been used to oppress us. But we're learning it, we're finding it, it's our tool. We're learning that the law which has been abused against us, we can use even against them. So this is a process and if we short circuit this process, and suddenly decide that we are going to switch from non-violence to violence, we are going to end up with a result that we may not want. Let me make this statement that I made at Vince, that what you get by violence, you must keep by violence. This is very important for you and I to understand. Should we reach for the change we want in Zimbabwe through violent means that it's very possible and there are very many people that are willing to do that. What you and I must understand is that we immediately train a generation that whenever they want something, they do it and they get it through violence. And so for me, this is why personally, the root of violence is not a root that I want, I would like to see us go. Another thing we have to understand is that our government, when it comes to violence and monopoly, they are masters at this game. They have done it for 36 years. So if you want to get on the street and become violent and throw stones, you and I will get beaten so badly. <laughs> That's why for me, what we did on the 6th of July, is the most powerful thing. The government felt the pain so much because all we did was we spoke to each other and said, let's just stay at home. We did something that everybody could get involved in. And the kind of Zimbabwe that we want to build going forward is a kind of Zimbabwe that everyone can build. Everybody stayed at home on the 6th of July. How do you arrest people for staying at home? There are so many. You know, this coming Saturday, one of the citizens inspired an idea that we've already put out. Our cricket team plays New Zealand. And we've said, hey, on this coming Saturday, on the, on the 6th, it's the 6th of August, isn't it? The 6th on Saturday, Zimbabwe plays New Zealand. It's a, a, a cricket game in Bulawayo. We said, take your flags, go and support the team. But in the 36th over, in the, when the 36th over begins, Everyone, spontaneously, stand up with your flags, sing the national anthem. Let's take that back too, because they thought it's theirs. It's ours. Yes. And, why? And, and we've made it clear. We've made it clear in the 36 over. Why 36 over? Because it is, it is, we are signifying that for 36 years we've been quiet, but now we stand up. Now, and I know for someone who sits with them, they sit back and they're like, ah. In short, someone will look back and say, ah, South Korea, you bought cricket, no, that she me. Someone will sit back and say, 
now, let me translate that. They sit back and say, well, so you think that if you sing a song, they're going to change just because of that. To be honest, they may not change after we sing. But that action is an addition to the other actions. Every action counts. Please, believe me and, 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 and understand this. Every action counts. Everyone, it counts. We are building up a bag of victories. When we started out online, they laughed at us and they said they are just keyboard warriors, like someone said. And they said, nah, these are people in the diaspora. And then the accusations, because they had to keep finding a way to explain why this movement was still around. So they moved on from saying, no, there are people in the diaspora. And then they went on to saying, it's just a fad, it's not going to last. And then they went on and they said, well, you actually, you know what? They are funded by the West. <laughs> and then they moved on from there again. And they said, actually, no, they are not funded by the West. These people are people that are being used by opposition political parties. And then they moved on and they kept trying. And the fact of the matter is this. You and I are on the right side of history. Something undeniable is happening in Zimbabwe. You can't deny it. So on that issue of violence, for me, I would, I continue as much as citizens can. Do not be violent because that's a game that you and I are not used to playing. But the non-violence, the staying at home, singing at the, at the, at the cricket game, doing the, the, the no to bond notes march that took place yesterday. Those kinds of things, our government doesn't know how to deal with people who are not violent. It confuses them when you don't want to beat anyone and all you want to just tell them You and I have to get more and more and more and more and more and more people onto the platform to be able to speak because our weapon as citizens is not a gun. Our weapon is our voice, but not just one voice. We need 13 million voices. I believe that as we continue to go the way that we are going, not long from here, there is going to be a city somewhere in Zimbabwe where a million people one million people will literally just walk on the street, just show up. Imagine if one day we just said, we're going to call a day, we're going towards a day where we want to call one million people to go to work as usual, but at lunchtime. <laughs> I mean, imagine that. Just imagine so many people have participated. They started online because it was a step for somebody to like a protest video. I met one lady at Avondale Shops in Zimbabwe and this is what she said to me when we met. She said to me, I'm so happy to see you. She said, you know, I've been watching your videos, but I must confess that the first time that I watched your video, I used to watch only five seconds of it because I was afraid that they were watching me through the video. <laughs> but you see, it's, it's easy for you and me to say, shoo, the fact is this, even when you are out here in Grahamstown, Sometimes when people are having a discussion about the injustices of government or you are having a, a, a discussion about what, what kind of change you want to see in Zimbabwe, even out here, you find that people still whisper and they still say, you know what you really want to see in Zimbabwe because you can't talk too loud. <laughs> my, my point is this, is that it was a step for someone to like a video. It was a step for someone to share a video. It was a step for someone to record themselves in their own video. It was a step for someone to go to a march to the consulate. It was a step for someone to go and raise a placard. We need to let everyone take their step. Everyone become bold enough to claim their space. Because that one day is coming, like I said, where everyone goes to work and you can't stop people from going to work. But everyone on that day, including the government, will know that at lunchtime. <laughs> See, here's the thing about this flag. The ideas and strategies that we are putting out to be able to hold our government to account, or to be able to challenge them, or to be able to force them to change certain policies, or to bring certain change, or certain reforms, are not strategies that are being hashed in some hiding place. The beauty of this flag is that these strategies are being done right in the open. We call each other, hey, let's go and march, and the government knows. 
Hey, why don't we go to the cricket game? You think they don't know we're going to be at the... They know, they know we're going to be at the cricket game with our flags singing the national anthem. The thing is this, is that it is, it is one of those things that they watch and they, they have no power to stop. I made this statement to our president the other day. After the day that he had threatened me and said, don't come back home. And I said in a talk I did, I think it was at Vince, I can't remember, I said, Mr. President, I hear you. With all your power, there are two things that you cannot stop. Number one, you cannot stop your sun from setting. And number two, you cannot stop mine from rising. In answering that question and a couple of others, there is an inevitability. <coughs> Look, it is undeniable. Zimbabwe is changing right now as we speak. It can't be stopped. Robert Mugabe knows it. All the politicians, in the, they know it. It cannot be stopped. It's time for something new to happen in Zimbabwe. So I hope I've answered one or two questions here. I'm going to ask Elif. By the way, Elif is, our, is one of our, part of our think tank. We have different think tanks around, uh, around the globe. Uh, and Elif is one, of, he's our, he's our, he's, he's one of the legal minds that just helps us to, to frame our thinking in terms of going forward. Henry is one of our strategists. In fact, him and I, uh, you know, sat together and we, you know, put together many little things that have become quite effective today. And I'm going to ask them to share a few, uh, you know, a few of their points and a few answers. But even before they come, you spoke the the gentleman who is the student of uh, I can't remember you. You're a student of movements, blah 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 blah. A really big word that you said. Yeah, there you go. Uh -huh. Which is amazing for me that there are people like you that study these things. You are very valuable to our generation in terms of the things that you are studying. But. An important aspect I think that I'm learning is that if we try and build this movement in the way that political movements have been built in the past, it is surely going to fail. Do you know how many politicians from ZANU PF have pushed us by way of mocking us to start a political party? Yeah. So they say to us, Nah, you guys, you guys think you're smart. Start a political party. Just start one. No, go ahead and start one because you know, that's what you want to do. Anyway. So start one. Let's and we'll deal with you. Yeah. And in my mind, and you have to help us think here. You have to help us look at this critically. In my mind, we 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 are building something here that is that doesn't have a secretary general. We're building something here that doesn't have a political commissar. But we're building something here whose leadership is so decentralized that they are as many leaders for the movement as they are people who are part of the movement. In other words, as much as I need, you also need. We talked with students at Stellenbosch yesterday and they said, so how do we, how do we practically effect this decentralization? And I said, why don't we do this? Why don't we create a think tank that's part of the uh, Zen Society on, on, on uh, at Stellenbosch. And what you guys do every night again, you sit down and think and come up with ideas. And whatever ideas you come up with, you can start them from Stellenbosch. We will drive everyone that we know to support it coming from there, but to do it where, wherever they are, you know, as well. And we can back it up and we can make it work. And so this is part of the ideas that are coming forth to say, hey, listen, this Ivan guy has already been banned from Zimbabwe. You know, so, you know, is he going back? I can tell you right now, I don't know if I'm going back. I'm t I want to go back home. But when citizen number one says... <laughs> when, citizen, when citizen number one says... The power it is. We don't want to live here. <laughs> you, you have to start thinking, hey, listen, 
I want to go back home, but I want this to be effective. So how can we, this is not about, it's not about me. It's, it's about all of us. Your ideas are as important and better than mine. Where is the, where, and, the and, and again, let me put it this way. Why should, should it all, always be called this flag? I'm happy that my peers in Zimbabwe started Tajamu. I'm happy because that is an expression of my generation too. I'm happy that my generation started this gown because there was no other way of showing the world the effects of unemployment and how unemployment in Zimbabwe at 90% has made every graduation gown become a symbol of wasted talent. They went ahead and put on their gowns and they went to sell sweets on the street, putting on their gowns. And suddenly they went and they played football in the street, putting on their gowns and their cap of knowledge. And suddenly the movement has moved from tweets to streets. But I couldn't have thought of that. And so I support it and I drive as much as I can people towards it. So for me, that's part of decentralizing. That if, if we can have more movements, more expressions that come up that are different from this flag, but have the same values and have the same goal, man, we can, we can, we can make change. This, these, these popcorn protests that are coming up in Zimbabwe. This is where we are. We can't wait for one man. We can't wait for one movement. Let me ask Ella for Henry to come up give us a couple of words. I've never been an activist. Um, it wasn't the thing that I, I thought of doing, you know. I didn't wake up one day and say, you know, at 16 and say, well, what do I want to do? I want to be an activist. No, actually, I, I went to university, came back home um, to the situation we live in. No jobs, uh, missed opportunities, uh, and you're operating at 10% of the capacity. And that's why I found a voice with this flag. What I want to encourage all of us is that whilst we wait for this big cataclysmic event to happen, the most important thing is that we lend our voice to the movement. Before you ask, what is somebody else going to do? What are you doing? Where you are? Yeah, on your campus, what are Zimbabweans doing? To show that you're not happy with the situation at home. The biggest thing that came to me is I said to myself, look, one day I'm going to have to look at my children. You know, when I have kids eventually, 20 years. <laughs> Not that old, but I'm gonna have to look at my children and I'm gonna have to say, they'll ask me, you know, what, what did you do? You know, this is what we've got, this is the country we inherited, what did you do? And what will I have to say? So that's the challenge of our generation. We have to do something. When our parents were our age, they were doing exactly what we were doing for an unjust system and an unjust government. So if anybody asks you why you're doing what you're doing, you ask them when you were my age, what were you doing? Yeah. That's it. So at the end of the day, let our, let our actions be guided by values. That's the most important thing. Values of non-violence, values of integrity. Treat each other humanly. We don't tear down to build up. There is no point of violence, there is no point of trying to destroy things in our own country that the taxpayer, the citizen, will have to pay for. At the end of the day, it's our country. The schools are our schools, the hospitals are our hospitals. Everything is ours, let's build our nation. And you know, one of the greatest things that we have in our country is education. All of you are sitting here at one of the finest schools in Africa, if not the world. And what you're learning is to take back to build your own country. Part of that education, the application is to say, look, how can we effect change in our country? How can we go back home and do something different? How can we show it's a system that has impoverished all of us that we've had enough? And whilst we're on that topic, young people, let's vote, eh? We know when elections are coming. We know it. Even if they are, go back home for elections. When they register for elections, go and register and go back home. Right? Get involved. Don't sit on the sidelines. There's no point. Because tomorrow we complain, but we've done nothing. 
people want to talk about how bad the politicians are, you go and run and be a councillor in your neighbourhood. What stops you when you graduate from going where you grew up and becoming a councillor? Nothing. You don't need to be told that. Have some pride. I think that's the thing we have to do now as young people. We can't no longer sit on the sidelines and watch other people and wait for somebody else to do it. That person will never come. It's you and I. So anyway, I just want to encourage you all and say, look, this is our country. We love it. We bleed the colors of our flag. Oh, come on, let's go. Every single day. <laughs> yeah, you talk about that. But, um, yeah, it's all about Zim, guys. Keep it in your heart. Nobody can take it away from you. This flag is not a politician's flag. National anthem is not any political party. Not one individual. Zimbabwe is bigger than one person or a bunch of people or an army or state security or whatever. Because the truth of the matter is that we don't care. It's our country. So guys, be encouraged. Keep the fire burning and well done for all coming out. Thank you for the platform. Uh, my name is Rachel Tagine And uh, I've been a, a civic actor in uh, Zimbabwe for the last seven years. So I've been in civil society work and my first question is to you, Pastor, and the movement. Uh, do you have any links with civil society? Why I'm saying this is because we as civil society did try to start desensitization as way back as 10, 15 years ago. And this current government, or the regime rather, because the party and the government are separate. We must understand that the party goes into the state machinery and becomes the government of the day, right? So this party went in and uniformed itself to become the government. So government is not entirely bad if you look at the practicality of, of things. So what I'm saying is this, they, they managed to massacre governance work in Zimbabwe. But there is still some work going on. Not all communities have access to smartphones and the media and all of this. Those communities are the ones that actually do go and vote. What kind of education is going on in those areas? Because I am involved in that kind of education where you work with community members and they sit down with their counselors asking them, Kuti counselor, Mariana Kabadara, Yemombe. Why haven't my, my house been oculated? Although I paid for it through council funds. Why hasn't council delivered this? Why hasn't my stand been serviced? So those are the practical ways that we are trying to have citizens effect their own accountability, demand accountability from the, the public officials. Now at a national level, it has become very polarized politically, right? And you have said that the politicians keep jesting you to form a party. But the way in which, how do we as citizens communicate our displeasure with the current party in government? And the, the, the formal way in a democracy is to use elections, right? So who do we go and vote for in 2018? Because The Mashonel and Central, Mashonel and West, all of that. Those are Zanu PF controlled areas. They have developed some areas, they haven't developed some. Then you look at Matabele. That's MDC. What have they brought to those people? Nothing. So who do we go and vote for? I think what you say is right with that. I almost every voice in this, in this room. I just have, I just have one question. Um, one of the challenges that we sort of um, endeavored any movement in Zimbabwe, be it political or non-political, is what I can call side-tracking or hijack <coughs> outside um, elements. And um, in a way, Zanfield has found a way of manipulating or taking that to their advantage and entrenching their position. Now, um, and one of the unintended consequences of such uh, um, approaches is that um, citizens, citizens in general have become sort of despondent or skeptical about any movement. 
Um, my, my question is, are you not concerned that um, you could also be sidetracked um, from the real issues vis-a-vis -vis, um, the ways and people always react? Once again, thank you so much. Sorry. I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for inspiring yeah. each and every one of us when he has been raised in terror, essentially. So, thank you. My question is not coming from a place of cynicism, but of real concern. When our ruling government has found itself in a place of being threatened, when it's on its dying legs, it has a tendency to lash out, to attack on a, on a wide scale. This movement is not about violence, but that in the event that 2018 comes, it possibly turns into another 2008. Is it my flag as beautiful as it is against a rifle? Or is there someone out there? I don't know what you have going on for you as you travel. Is there someone who will be there to help us as the people? Because at the end of the day, we will protest, we will fight, but the human body cannot withstand bullets. Is someone going to be there to help us fight as we fight? Will someone be there to stand with us? Is my question. This flag is not a political party. If Pastor Evan is to vote in 2018, we'll vote for that. Actually. And then, um, what's the movement message to opposition parties? I think it's important for us as well to understand where we've come from and where we're going. We obviously be, being on the road and having to speak to a lot of people, we've obviously faced the same kind of questions. People have the same kind of concerns. But I think. It is important, I think it's very, very important for students and citizens alike to realize the progress that we've made in the last two months. I don't see an appreciation of that from students. I mean, I do not think this would have been possible five years ago in Zimbabwe. You know, for some guy, well, I'm sure there was no doubt back then. There's no guy with a shot of video. But I'm so humbled, I'm so amazed by the strides that we have made in the last two months, just to be able to speak out and to claim our space as citizens and not as subjects of, you know, subjects rather, of someone who tends to rule over us. So I think <coughs> that should always be the thinking with regard to the flag in terms of where we're coming from and where we're going. Now, with regard to um, this flag not being a political party, that's yours. But the message to opposition parties, we don't want to answer that. We don't want to answer that question because we're not speaking to a political party, we're speaking to the issues that affect Zimbabweans. Before you were MDC, before you were ZANU PF, ZOOM, ZANU Ndonga, whatever those parties decide to call themselves, you're Zimbabwe. So, the issues and the kind of questions that we want addressed, for example, are not going to be arrested by one paycheck if you pay civil servants today. They're the issues that civil servants, even the police that beat people, are going to be facing those issues come November, come December. So we don't have a message for political parties, we have a message for Zimbabwe. And that is the message for this flag. Thank you. Thanks very much to, to Ellen. I, I want to kind of add on to that, you know, what's our message to political parties? And I know 
that Elif has kind of said, well, you know what, we're speaking to the citizens. You know, I, I, I suppose for me, one of my one of my goals as we participate in this movement is to is to not lose is to not lose that voice and that and that perspective of a citizen. You know, I, I remember talking to some of our team and I said, guys, I don't want to start sounding like a politician. I want to always be a citizen because this from here I can I can best articulate the issues because I live them every day. So even sometimes when I think about the opposition political parties in Zimbabwe and how or, or what I would say to them, it's simple. Zimbabweans are people that are looking for inspiration. We're looking for something that can capture the imagination of Zimbabweans. And for me, the message to them is very clear. The citizenry has risen up and is giving a chance to you to be able to step up and to be able to say, hey, can we paint a picture together of a future that we deserve? The citizens are giving a chance to our opposition politics to say, can you be different politicians? Can you actually be people who care? Can you actually be people who care? Because we, we're starting to school each other and school ourselves in choosing the leadership that we want. That's what's going on with this movement even at this point. So even one of the questions that people have asked and said, so what else are we doing going forward? Well, we're looking for us to educate each other concerning voter registration should in the event that 2018 <coughs> happens. Hey, maybe at some point we might be able to pressure them to have early elections or to have the reforms that we want. And we're ready to embrace civic society. Of course, the important thing is to understand that as citizens, we fund our own struggle. People have asked me, so where are you getting money from? Uh, you know, the president said that Mawadide must go where he's funded. For me, it's my phone and, and, and my data bundle, so I should actually go to my mobile phone company, uh, as, as he says, that's where I should go. But my point is this, is that as citizens, we're funding this out of our own pockets. When we had the stay away on the 6th of July, every Zimbabwean funded that day, they funded that struggle, they funded that message. We funded it with the wages that we were supposed to earn that day. We funded it with the money that was supposed to put food on our table. We funded it with the money that was supposed to send our children to school. And for me, that's the exciting bit, to get people step by step, to start saying, I will sacrifice this, I will sacrifice myself, I will sacrifice you know, my life to be able to stand. And then to answer your question, which was such an impassioned question, who are we going to have to stand with us in the day that standing up against people that actually have rifles is required? The day I came out of court, something was proved to me that I thought was actually not possible. That you and I can stand together literally as each other's representative. Elif told me a, an interesting poem that I'm going to try and recite just the section that he told me. And I don't know how well I can do this, but even if you said that when they came in the 1980s and they abused my brothers and sisters in Matebeleland through Gukurawundi, nobody went and stood for them. And then when they, when they came in the 1990s, with the economic structural adjustment program and took my parents' earnings and everything they had worked for, nobody stood for them. And then when they came in the 2000s and they chased farmers off their farms and refused to compensate and killed people for refusing to get off the farms, whether or not you and I think it's right, nobody stood for them. And, and, and then they came again in 2008 and they raided our bank accounts and took everything that we had and, and nobody stood for my parents. The question in my mind now is, who will stand when they come for me? And I think for me the answer is found in the person sitting next to you. Is that 
if that person <laughs> and you know you know what that was the perfect answer to say ah Because if the person sitting next to you is not prepared to stand for you, then you're on your own and you have a problem. And this is where we've got to get to, where my problem is not just my problem, but it's also your problem. An injustice to one is an injustice to all. Somebody sent me a message on my Facebook page two days ago and all they simply wrote was you are such a coward. And I want to admit today that they are right. I am a coward. I've been a coward for 36 years. Been a coward for a very long time. It's all I've ever known to do. So forgive me if I'm not as brave as you require me to be, even though you use a pseudo name on your Facebook account. My point in saying this is that don't expect other people to congratulate you on your bravery and expect that that becomes your reason for standing up. We don't stand up because everyone else thinks it's a good idea. We do it because we ourselves believe it more than anyone else. And when we do that, we inspire those around us also to be able to stand up. And I think I'm done on that. I don't know if I've got any more other questions. Thank you very much.